Michigan is now a right to work state. There's a new emergency manager law. The lame duck session was anything but lame. And the man who signs the bills and answers to the voters, Governor Rick Snyder, is here to talk about it all. My week starts now. Michigan's turnaround is being powered by things we do better than anywhere else in the world. Today's global leaders routinely turn to Michigan to work on their most difficult problems. That's because the engineering talent in this part of the world is simply the best. So many possibilities lie ahead for Michigan's future. These opportunities are here and starting to happen. The vision for the new Michigan. Share it, talk it up, drive it home. A route map shows you where we go, but not how we get there. Because in this business, there are no straight lines, only the twists and turns of an unpredictable industry. So the 80,000 employees at Delta must anticipate the unexpected and never let the rules overrule common sense. This is how we tame the unwieldiness of air travel until it's not just lines you see, it's the world. Hi there, and thanks so much for joining us on My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. We cannot start tonight without recognizing the tragedy in Newtown, Connecticut. The loss of children and adults in the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Our thoughts are with all of those who are affected tonight. And now to Michigan. Can you remember a busier and more controversial time in the state capitol? Michigan is now the 24th right to work state. A whirlwind lame duck session has yielded a new emergency manager law, along with other bills on abortion, personal property tax, and a Detroit Lighting Authority. Tonight, our entire show is devoted to talking to the one man who says Michigan is undergoing a once in a generation. Transformation. But after these past few days, voters may be split on if that transformation is a positive one. As always, our My Week contributors, the editorial page editors of the Detroit Free Press and Detroit News, are here with us, Stephen Henderson and Nolan Finley, gentlemen. And joining us in studio is Governor Rick Snyder. Governor, welcome to My Week. Uh, happy to be with you. You have had a tremendous last couple of weeks. How would you describe, have you ever experienced anything like this in governing the state of Michigan in the last two years? Well, no, this was a very active week. Um, it was a challenging week because, again, some people were very upset, and I respect that. Um, it's time to work through those issues, though, and keep moving Michigan forward. We're the comeback state in the United States, and we should be proud of that. We were the sixth fastest growing state last year after being 50 for how many years? Um, there are tough issues out there, but let's work through them and keep moving forward. I appreciate that you're going to be here with us for the entire entire half hour here as we talk. We have a lot of things to talk about. I don't think with these guys we're going to have any shortage of, of topics to touch on. But let's start, of course, gentlemen, with right to work. A lot of the criticism, Governor, has been to you in talking about what people perceive to be a reversal of position, that you said you didn't want to see right to work on the agenda, but then embraced it on your agenda about two weeks ago. Talk to people about what went into your decision-making process there, and were there any kind of behind-the-scenes discussions with labor unions in why you did put it on your agenda? Sure, I'm happy to, because I appreciate the question. If you go back to 2009, originally when I started campaigning, I, did, I was open to say I would sign if it ended on my desk, but I, I further analyzed that before I really started campaigning in earnest and listened to a lot of good people, because they, I got advice to say it's a very divisive issue. And I, got, I looked at the numbers, and it only applies to less than 20% of our workforce. So at that point in time, still in 2009, I said, I don't want it on the agenda in terms of my agenda because it would cause too much division, and we had higher priorities. We needed to do tax reform, budget, so many different things, and we got a lot of those done. So if you fast forward to the summertime of this last year, um, we had a situation where labor leaders were looking to put forward a ballot proposal. They were collecting petitions to say to do pr what became proposal two. Did you warn them that there would be backlash? Well, that's the point, Christy, is actually I did, went to a meeting of uh, the Labor Management Council, and I was quite open to say, please don't go forward with this, because if you go forward with this on proposal two, it's not going to restrict the discussion to just that issue. It, it will make right to work an issue and other labor-related issues. And I said, I would expect to see that you could even see a petition drive on right to work or other consequences. And I said, please don't move forward. Um, the petition drive didn't happen on right to work, but they moved forward with proposal two. It was soundly defeated by the voters for good reason. But after the election, the discussion on right to work didn't stop. It kept going, and it became a divisive discussion. It was going on to the point where 
a week or so ago, I said it is now on my agenda, but I didn't call for action then. I said, let's get labor people talking to legislative leaders. Let's try to work through. Are there other options and alternatives to work out something that could be a, a different path? That was unsuccessful. It didn't work. So then we're on this situation of having divisiveness going on, whether I wanted it or not. And being a good leader, my view is, is you've got a situation, now let's show some leadership. Governor. Let's look at the issues, stand up, take a position that I believe is right for Michigan. This is about worker choice and this is about jobs for Michiganders. Hey, Governor, you mentioned before that you had brought labor and mm -hmm. uh, some of the legislative leaders together to yeah. talk about this. Can you give us a, a better picture of what was going on in those, in those negotiations? We've not really heard a lot about what was being talked about, what was being offered, what was being asked uh, of labor, and why you feel like they just broke down? Well, again, what I would say is, is it was about getting a number of senior labor leaders um, with some of the legislative leaders from the Republican side primarily, and to say, is there some common ground things to say that both sides could say, okay, if we worked on these things, everyone could calm down on labor issues for an extended period of time. And well, in some ways, Stephen, I, I don't even know if I'd say they broke down. It just didn't get far enough to find common ground to really work through it. And in retrospect, if I really looked at it, I th think it was unfortunate that if people would have spent more time talking, and I'm including myself, so I don't blame anyone. In terms of the timing, I don't say it was the labor leaders issue, why this all happened. It was like if all of us would have built more personal relationships, spent more time over the last couple of years, it could have been a different discussion, but that didn't happen. And since we're going to face this, and I didn't see value in having an ongoing battle over right to work continuing into the next year until potentially you know you could get into election season and stuff. So my view is is step up. I do believe the public policy side is correct. But let's but, get an answer and move on. But going forward, I mean, my email uh, box and my uh, phone uh, voicemail are full of. Uh, people who describe themselves at least as Democrats or independents who supported you uh, two years ago thinking that this was not part of the agenda as you had said. What can you say to them about why they should now trust you or why Democrats in the legislature or labor should trust you going forward to, to sort of collaboratively uh, govern Government. Well, I believe I stuck true to everything I said and I represented. What I would say is I was not successful in keeping it off the agenda in terms of what I had said was not enough to keep an escalating discussion regardless of my own view or position on this and that took place. But if you looked at where I said, you know, I said very early on it was clear what direction I would have gone. It was very clear that I worked very diligently and was successful for a long time in keeping it off. What I, and I actually gave notice to say if you start all this labor discussion starting with proposal two, I may not be able to keep a lid on all this, and that was an accurate statement. Well, Governor, the conversation this week is that Rick Snyder has changed somehow. Um, he has broken this coalition he had with independents and moderate Democrats, but really over the last two years, how much cooperation have you had from Democrats and from unions? Fairly limited, if you really look at it, where the votes counted on a number of issues. I mean, it's been very limited participation. And so that's one of the challenges here is, is I still always want to try to work with people. I mean, again, fundamentally, I think I've been clear. I have my philosophy of relentless positive action, no blame, no credit, just solving problems. And I don't fight with people. And I don't view I fought with anyone in this process. Because again, here's a situation that I saw, you know, demonstrations, other problems going on in our state, and they're not happening today. But you do They're still upset people. Well, well right. <laughs> I mean, and and it's, it's, it's a little bit, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of yeah. a big ask to say, well, you know, I've firebombed your house, but work with me to rebuild the neighborhood. I mean, I think that's how labor feels, and I don't think that's, uh, that's going to go away anytime, anytime soon. Well, a couple things. First of all, I think there are a lot of union members that would like the right to choose. And they're not going to speak up in this environment. There's no motivation to take a position. And one of the things in the press conference that actually really struck me is I, was, I had a teacher sitting next to me. And she'd come from Texas. And she told the story about she wanted to be a union member in Texas because she saw value from the union. And she actually said, I wanted to join. But it was important to me to have choice. And she said, as my career changed, I made different decisions to join or not join based on seeing value or not. And isn't it important? I think it's great 
when someone shows value, they get paid. If they're not showing value, it's a fair question to say, should you put your hard-earned resources towards it? Governor Snyder, you have talked a lot about a potential economic impact now that Michigan is a right-to-work state. In this last four days, have you gotten calls from corporations? Is there any kind of movement that you're hearing now that Michigan is a right-to-work state, that we're going to see new investment here? Yeah, in terms of four days, it's a pretty short time period. But what I would say is there are the, the site consultants that actually do this work that are very excited to talk to their client base to say Michigan is now a right-to-work state and will be included in much more reviews. And again, the, the fact pattern I, I looked at was Indiana because there are a lot of studies that go back and forth on this issue that are on a statewide basis that I think have some issues with them. But Indiana is a great illustration. They did similar legislation in February. They've got 31 companies that have announced they're coming to Indiana and right to work was a major factor in that decision. Don't they have other incentives? Is, don't they have other they incentives have other as incentives, well? But that wasn't the big variable, the big change. And these are companies that actually mentioned right to work as a key criteria that brought them into Indiana that they weren't looking before. So, so this will bring jobs to Michigan. No, Governor, you can wrap you, up right to work for us. You, now that you have this, I mean, the challenge for you is to make it work. Yeah. Um, if two years from now people don't see the return on this bill. You, you're going to have to explain it uh, when you run for re-election if you do. How do you intend to market right to work? Well, uh, again, I think that it's not just marketing right to work, it's marketing all the good things we've done in Michigan. Because again, a lot of it hasn't fully gotten out into the public across the country, but we are going to be ramping up our marketing. Um, we've been aggressive. This will be added to the list, but it's not just other things that even happened this week. Personal property tax reform will help. Um, we had the unemployment insurance thing with a big bond offering this year. They got bond deal of the year in the country um, for helping bring down costs to that employers. That awards show wasn't televised. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> no, nope. the Oscars. But I mean, those are things, though, all those things add up in terms of sending the right message about Michigan is the place to do business. And I'm not stopping there because, again, this gets back to the issue of talent. One of my priorities for this next year, one of my top priorities, is to do a better job of connecting where jobs are for now and for the future, and where our kids are and how they get their education because there are so many great skilled trade jobs out there today, for example. Governor, you talked a lot about some of the other movement that happened in the legislature in the past couple of weeks. Let's talk about the new emergency financial manager law. Tell people how this differs from PA4. Yeah, we listen to the people. Um, and again, people can take different things out of the vote. The main thing, the main message I got out of the vote in November is people thought there should be more local involvement in the process. And that's what was added in this legislation. So what we did was is to say where there's a situation where there is an emergency that's been done through an objective process, um, the local city council can make a decision. Do they want to have a consent agreement? Do they want an emergency manager? Do they want to try a mediated settlement? Or do they want to look at bankruptcy? And they make the choice. If they happen to choose an emergency manager and they would make that choice, once the emergency manager is in place, if the emergency manager came forward with savings based on a set of activities and they didn't like it, they would have the option to come forward to say, we're going to propose an alternative. It would need to add to that same value amount, but they could propose an alternative. And then it would be to decide which option. The, the, one of the other pieces in this, after a set amount of time, a community could decide they don't want to have an emergency manager anymore and they could vote and the emergency manager would be done. Um, so very much we had a number of steps to get more, much more local involvement. Right, and, and that's, that's uh, true and is reflected in the bill, but another thing that's reflected in the bill is that the state uh, sort of hammer if, uh, if communities uh, agree to these things and then don't meet all the conditions, uh, the, the, the trigger uh, moves faster. And I think some of the criticism of, of some of the opponents of, of, of PA4 uh, is that this bill actually puts them in, in worse position in terms of uh, the fear of a state takeover. How would you respond to that? No, what it does is uh, the default say in many cases, if they don't make decisions or different things, is a mediated settlement. To say, isn't it relevant to get a mediator involved, to get all their creditors involved with the community and try to negotiate something out? I, I think that's a very rational answer. Governor, when you think of emergency manager, you think of Detroit because mm -hmm. it's been the, the, the most dramatic case so far in Michigan. But this bill really doesn't kick in in time to help Detroit much, does it? You're going to have to no. make decisions about Detroit before March when the bill goes into effect. Where do, what do you see those decisions? Where do you see those going? Yeah, you're correct, Nolan, because it does, this bill will not be effective until late March. Mm -hmm. um, the 30-day clock is already going on Detroit. So that will make some point in January, the review committee will come back with a report, and it could very well say there's an emergency. 
and then I have options about appointing an emergency major or not. Or taking the, the steps toward bank, bankruptcy, correct? Yeah, again, the, there are a series of steps, but again, this is where I think I've, hopefully I'm viewed as a, a very supportive partner of trying to work very hard with the city of Detroit in terms of the mayor and city council with the consent agreement. The problem is not enough has gotten done. I still encourage them to be very prudent to take that list, that appendix, and get as many things done because, again, you don't that would still the help the situation. don't quo to be in place at the end of January when this process... Well, again, I'm not going to speculate on that. I need to see the review report. This is not the time for decisions. This is the time for people to get the facts and put them on the table. Yeah, we're going to delve into Detroit in, in just a little bit, but I want to take a look at the entire lame duck legislation process that when we put out on Facebook and Twitter today that you're going to be on my week for the entire show and we ask people for their questions, a lot of the comments that we were getting is people disappointed in the process that we see legislators, the flurry of activity up until 4.30 in the morning, jamming through legislation after legislation that people perceive that they never got a chance to either chime in on or talk about. Um, tell us how you're going to be dealing with a lot of the bills that are going to come to your desk on abortion, on the concealed weapons, um, in light of what tragedy we have seen today, and how people have been reacting to this process as a whole. Yeah, there, there are more bills than normal in a period like this. We have had it where historically you're going to see a flurry at the end of every year end in every sort of summer period before they go back to the Would district. Would you say, though, that this is something that there, we haven't seen there before? There are more major pieces of legislation. A lot of them, though, have been discussed for some time. So, again, there, there were fairly open hearings on most of these. And when you even talk about right to work, um, right to work since the election has been a very visible issue. So I think every Michigander in our state knew right to work was a serious topic being discussed, and people had opportunities to talk to legislators. So there's a lot of discussion, but there are a lot of different pieces to this. Some are great, though. I mean, the Regional Transit Authority getting done. Here's a project that's been 40 years in the making. Yes. This was attempt number 24. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it had been like Groundhog Day of unsuccessful attempts to get this done. It has gotten done. Detroit lighting is a situation that... You could say it happened pretty quickly, but it had been out there yeah, for months. For a long time. I, think, I think when people are criticizing the process, they are talking about the more controversial bills, some of which did just show up on the floor this week. Uh, they were not subject to public hearings. Uh, you also saw, you know, very hurried uh, votes on them, and then you signed them very quickly. And that's not, that's not unique to the, to the GOP. Uh, we've seen Democrats do that before in the past, but again, it, it undermines the process by which people feel like they're, they're getting a fair shake. Well, to put it in perspective, I mean, uh, they had a lot of hearings on different issues. They decide the schedule of what they want to tee up and pass or not. I appreciate it. They did take a number of our major initiatives, but there are things that didn't get done that uh, I would have preferred sure. to see get done. Right. For example, like the Educational Achievement yeah, Authority. Right. But, uh, Governor, when you look at the bills that were expected to be the most controversial, um, they were the abortion bills coming to your desk. I know your staff and you worked on these bills before they ever got um, through the legislature. But now, in light of the shooting today, the, the emphasis, the attention is on the gun bill, the um, concealed weapons bill that the legislature passed. Did what happened today um, out east affect your opinion of that bill or what you might do with that bill? Well, it does impact you. You can't, you can't have it not impact you. And my thoughts and prayers go with everyone in Connecticut. I know that we all share that view. I mean, it does strike you as something that, that will really cause me to reflect even more on this will bill. Will you veto it? Well, again, I, I don't want to speculate because I haven't even seen the final bill. They were still making amendments and such. And so to be fair to the legislative process, it's not right that I simply arbitrarily have an answer when I should be a good listener and a reviewer. But again, it gives you serious pause to say, is this appropriate? And the, and the abortion reforms, are you going to sign, are you going to veto that? Are you going to sign that? Well, the same thing, Christy, that they were making amendments and changes. We had dialogue on a number of the issues because, again, the point is, if you look at it, I'm not even sure it should fully be called an abortion bill in a lot of ways. It involved abortions in the context, but some of the features of that particular law, the one bill, was about addressing coercion. And coercion is wrong in every case, whether it's involved in bullying in school or any situation. There is also parts about safety inspections and such that are important to women's health in general. So again, there are more controversial pieces, less. And I'll make a review seeing what they finally passed, because as you said, it came down to the wire on some of these. In the next couple of weeks, you'll be reviewing Yeah, those? in the next couple of weeks. Probably is. in some cases, I don't get the bills immediately. It takes them a few days to process. So this will probably be over the next three, four weeks. Let's talk quickly about Detroit. We uh, have started to talk to it. Uh, when would you say, in your mind, 
um, what was it that you feel that the consent agreement had started to fail maybe in Detroit, that an emergency financial manager would not be brought in? Well, it was a, a lack of action. It was a lack of action in terms of we did a consent agreement that had an appendix that the city council approved, that the mayor signed off on, that we signed off on to say here's a list of items that need to get done for Detroit to be successful. Much of that list didn't get done. And it's fairly straightforward that if it's not happening, Detroit's financial situation was continuing to go downhill. There was more bad news where they found additional problems of 20 or $30 million in terms of pension payments and such to accelerate that process even more. So it was time to step up to say enough is enough. Let's start this clock and to really encourage them to go through a list. And I want to give them credit. They did some you know, important steps forward on Tuesday of this week, and I believe mm -hmm. they're going to meet more and try to get through the list. The challenge is, is it enough in the time frame that's left? I mean, it's, it's clear that the consent agreement uh, wasn't working, but, but I'm wondering what your assessment is of the role of the two state approved uh, officials here. You had Chris Andrews there as the program manager and Jack Martin as the CFO. The pension uh, oversight, shouldn't that have been caught by the financial processes that they put in place? I mean, uh, there's always this pushback in Detroit about whether the state is playing the role that it should play in these, in these, uh, in these partnerships. That seemed like uh, a, a pretty clear finance issue that, that we missed there. Well, again, I don't want to say they made a mistake. I don't know enough about the details. What I would say, though, is, is they really report to the mayor. I mean, we help select them and uh, pick them, true. but they're part of the, they're part of the, administration. the, the administration for right. the city of Detroit. Um, Governor, the city has burned through $85 million, or, or on its way to burning through $85 million of the 135 that you helped them bond mm -hmm. for. Get to the point in, in January, February, and that money is, there's no more money left. Do you expect state taxpayers to be on the hook for keeping Detroit's lights on, keeping it operating? No. How will you avoid it? Well, that's the point of getting the 30-day clock going while there's still a reasonable amount of money from those bond proceeds. Because, so, again, that's important. And I think I, I want to compliment Treasurer Dillon. I think he's been pretty straightforward in laying out the issues to, to say there's dollars needed. You're going to have to do some serious slashing, then, of expenses between now and then. Well, hopefully, again, the mayor and city council will take a lot of those actions on their own without waiting for the 30 days to pass. Governor, let's go ahead and take a look at January and look down the road a little bit in your next two mm -hmm. years. Um, one, of the, one of the issues in talking about education is the Educational Achievement Authority yeah. did not get as expanded role um, that the legislature was hoping to, to get through. Uh, what are your plans for that coming up in, uh, in January and beyond? And what do you think that you'd like to tackle some of your main agenda items in the next year or so? Yeah, the Educational Achievement Authority is a great opportunity. It's really about innovation with some of the most challenged schools and the kids that need the most help. And it's succeeding. It's really cool. And part of it is getting more people aware about the great work being done. So I hope to get more people visiting the schools, talking to these young people. Once you talk to these kids, it strikes your heart. It's just incredible. Um, and to get that to happen. And the goal of the EAA is not to be this monolithic thing across the state in terms of taking over all the schools. It's to help the places that are most challenged. And the other part is to be a laboratory of innovation where districts can grab those ideas and do them on their own and actually give EAA feedback. So that's cool. Um, a couple big things is I want to do an economic development summit in March about really defining what are the jobs open in Michigan now and for the future. Um, there are great skilled trades opportunities. There are needs for more STEM university mm -hmm. graduates. Um, in April, we're going to do an education summit about bringing the two sectors together to say, let's match supply and demand. Great Lakes is an important issue. I want to do a conference with other governors from the Great Lakes to talk about aquatic invasives. All right, and you have a very full agenda, and I can't believe how quickly 25 minutes <laughs> just went by. Right. <laughs> Noel and Stephen, I know we're done. Thank you so much. And Governor Rick Snyder, thank you so much for joining us for my week. We so appreciate it. Great to be with you. Okay, and that is going to do it for my week. Thanks for watching. There is still a lot to talk about. So Nolan, Stephen, and I are going to continue the discussion after the show right now on myweek.org. You'll also be able to find our web extra on Facebook and on Twitter at myweek. For all of us at Detroit Public TV, I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great weekend. Come back and see us next Friday night. Business Leaders for Michigan is dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and economic growth. Learn more at businessleadersformichigan.com. A route map shows you where we go, but not how we get there. Because in this business, there are no straight lines, only the twists and turns of an unpredictable industry. So the 80,000 employees at Delta must anticipate the unexpected and never let the rules overrule common sense.
This is how we tame the unwieldiness of air travel. Until it's not just lines you see, it's the world.